So I've had a lot of fun putting together a history of Voyager. I just celebrated the 35th anniversary of the launch, and I've been involved since about then. So I'm going to tell you, but one of the cool things is that it started all when, uh, because of Syzygy, which, by the way, you can maximum scrub score is 123. <laughs> <laughs> um, though there aren't actually three wides in the scrub <laughs> The point is this, that you get alignment of uh, the planets and that they, they occur all in the same quadrant. And in March uh, 1982, it was realized uh, that these would all be in the same quadrant. Uh, and the closest they would have all been in terms of angular uh, uh, association for about 800 years. The important point, though, is to go to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune uh, the occurrence of them being sort of in, in, in appropriate alignment only happens about 170 years. And this was realized at just the right time. 1966, a uh, student at Caltech, uh, Gary Flandro, um, who later went on to be a professor in Tennessee, who specialized in orbital mechanics, uh, he realized that you could get gravity assists at Jupiter to uh, fly by uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and this opportunity, the, the best opportunity would be 1977. So just in time, they realized that uh, they'd be able to, if you could arrange a, a grand tour, you would be able to have a tour of the giant planets. And indeed, President Nixon approved the grand tour in March of 1970. Unfortunately, as tends to happen, and this is deja vu all over again, when our, our missions tend to run into cost overruns and people panic because of rising costs, and yet that pesky little Mars does it again, um, uh, there was a problem and they had to uh, cut back. The grand tour was too grand, too expensive. Uh, so in current year dollars, it's about half a JWST. And um, so they cut it back to just Jupiter, Saturn. But of course, everyone knew that the opportunity would be there to go on to Uranus and Neptune, and they were planning and hoping to keep it very quiet. But it so uh, for a cost of uh, 250 million, MJS was approved in uh, February of uh, 1972, and Ed Stone uh, was made project scientist. So this was Mariner, Jupiter, Saturn, later became Voyager, uh, and uh, you know you can look at the cost, but it's basically a candy bar per taxpayer per year. Uh, oh, no, not per year, total candy bar per person. If you did it per year, it would be you know, 35 years of law. So total, and you know they've estimated 11,000 people or work years uh, involved in this. It's a bomb. <laughs> so uh, this is the orbit that was taken. It was launched in, in uh, so the two spacecraft were launched, both flybys of Jupiter and, and Saturn, and then Voyager 2 went on to Uranus and Neptune. We'll come back to this uh, trajectory a few times. So the benefit uh, you get by going past Jupiter is that you can use Jupiter's orbital momentum to get a kick and go on to uh, the next place. And technically, you can look at the vectors in a Jupiter centered frame. The speed in is the same as the speed out. But if you're in the Sun uh, frame, you gain a little bit of the Jupiter orbital momentum. And one nice cartoon that illustrates this is the idea that if you throw a ball off a moving train, the moving ball gains the extra momentum. And in some ways, we use the spacecraft going past. Jupiter to gain some of that orbital momentum of Jupiter getting a gravity assist on. We've been doing this now in, in uh, solar system exploration, all sorts of places using gravity assist in many different ways. Voyager was not actually the first. But the great gain here is if we look at uh, velocity relative to the sun as a function of distance, which is of course time also, you'll see but as it, this, the, the uh, red line is the Voyager 2 velocity, at first it slowed down as it 
climbed out of the gravitational well. The sun sped up as it went past, and each time it went past, it got a kick, except out at Neptune, where it went uh, over the poles rather than get uh, around the side to get it. <coughs> so you can see that even after the first uh, uh, flyby, the, the Jupiter flyby, got enough to leave the solar system, enough energy to leave the solar system. So this is the game that was played by this spacecraft. And um, to give you a sense of scale, if we were to put it here, the uh, antenna would be basically the width of this table. Uh, these, these instruments are all sort of this size, you know, a little heavy to carry. And these are the radioisotope thermoelectric generators, each of which are canisters of this size. So this is the uh, configuration. There's a, uh, a, there are 11 science investigations. There's a 40-foot boom with an inboard and outboard magnetometer, uh, antennas that I think were about 12 feet long. You see Larry's in the audience correctly. If I get, if you know something that I say wrong. Um, there were cameras. Uh, Ultraviolet spectrometer, plasma instrument, that's what I was involved, I'll talk a bit about that. Low energy charge particles, cosmic rays. Photopolarimeter, this is the instrument that was built here in Lass. Were you involved in building that, Mark? Yes. There we are. An engineer in the room who was involved in building it. Infrared, uh, infra uh, interferometer spectrometer. And then um, uh, there is, of course, a uh, the radio dish was used for radio sounds. So this is what powered the system, radioisotope thermoelectric generator, using plutonium-238. Note this is not the nuclear bomb, plutonium. Uh, and this decays, and uh, the particles coming off alpha particles are absorbed by a blanket, and the temperature difference between the inside, where these particles are being produced, and the outside, it's cold, it uses thermocouples to convert that into power and about uh, 470 watts at the time of launch. And it decays with a 80 something year lifetime. So uh, by the time, this is a quote here, uh, that by October uh, 2011, I just got this off the JPL website to get some numbers, it's dropped by 57% um, but there's, there's, there's still plenty uh, around to keep it going for quite some time. <coughs> so of course, one of the things that uh, Voyager is famous for is the fact that Carl Sagan and some colleagues put together uh, a phonograph with, with greetings in, in 55 languages, lots of images, natural sounds, music, and so on. We have this disc with um, images that sort of symbolize our civilization. I say that in some hesitation, and maybe I should put it in quotation marks. It was basically Carl Sagan and his buddy's idea of what civilization was about. And this, of course, was strapped onto the spacecraft and sent out with the thought that maybe sooner or later somebody, uh, some being in some distant place, would find the spacecraft and read these symbols and learn all about us humans here on Earth. Okay, so let's talk about me. And um, this is uh, my graduation picture from the University of Lancaster in the United Kingdom. And I'm very pleased to say that my undergraduate advisor, John Hungry, just happens to be in the audience. And uh, I graduated physics group there in 1976. And then I went to MIT. Of course, 1976 was the bicentennial. <laughs> <laughs> and they were celebrating getting rid of those pesky Brits. So it was kind of an interesting time to be alive in, uh, in the United States. I joined the plasma team in uh, at the Center for Space Research, where Herb Bridge and Jim Sullivan had shown here. Uh, colleagues were involved. They had just built. This is a, a, um, a model of the plasma instrument. These are Faraday cups that measure the plasma in the solar wind and in the magnetospheres. It's strapped on um, the other side of the cameras on the Voyager spacecraft. It's about 
this size, and uh, this is what I've worked on. My uh, project as a grad student was to predict what we would see when we got to Jupiter. We knew that there was going to be material coming from EO. It was known that there was uh, sulfur ions coming spewing out of EO. We didn't know why at that time. And uh, my job um, was to take those optical observations from telescopes and predict what we would see as we flew through. Uh, and I'll just show you here, uh, I couldn't find, I'm afraid, an actual picture, but a diagram of the LASP uh, instrument, uh, photopolymer and the for science experiment, that is basically an eight inch telescope. Okay, so launch, 1977. Uh, Voyager 2 was launched before Voyager 1, uh, but very close together, both from the Cape with a tight center. So what did we know about the planets, outer planets, before Voyager? And actually, it's really hard to, to forget all of that stuff that we've done since then. Right? It's kind of hard to forget that. And what I did was to go back and look at some earlier um, publications and ask um, some colleagues, Clark Chapman very kindly lent me a whole bunch of textbooks uh, from the pre-Voyager era. And you can see that the pictures that at that time, this is from the Hale Observatory, you know, you've got the great red spot, and this is from the pioneers, the pioneers that flew by in uh, 1973 and 1974. <coughs> you know, not, not, not very good resolution, uh, and uh, uh, this is the best pioneer flyby picture took, uh, so the cameras really did not have uh, great capability of taking uh, lots of pictures. Though what was important, I have to say, about Pioneer flying past Jupiter was that the pioneers had a lot of particle instruments that could measure the radiation environment at Jupiter. That was very important for designing and planning the Voyager spacecraft and subsequent spacecraft uh, that went to the system. So, um, this is the pioneer view of, of Saturn and Titan. Uh, and I don't think ground-based telescopes were, were not even that good. This is uh, Uranus from the ground. Of course, we did that, that, this Voyager was the first spacecraft to go past. These are the, uh, 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 some moons. This is Neptune with, with Triton uh, from the ground-based telescopes at the time. And uh, there was a lot of spectroscopic studies that were done looking at uh, reflected sunlight, and this is Uranus and this is Jupiter, um, you, can, you can work out what's in the atmosphere. For example, Uranus has a lot of methane, um, and, and Jupiter has a little less, but you can, you can do a lot of things like that, but uh, only so much from ground-based <coughs> use. And indeed, the Galilean satellites, which were first observed by Galileo in 1610, we've just um, celebrating the 400th anniversary of looking at these satellites, but all we had done in that in the meantime, you know, this was the kind of the best thing we could do with Ganymede, and then we could measure things like the phase angle, that's the reflectance as a function of angle of the sunlight coming in and hitting the surface, which kind of tells you a little bit about the properties, but really not a whole lot. Okay, so this is the this is the. Voyager PR team, and this is uh, Charlie Horde from, uh, from LASP. Um, there are a couple of people I don't know there. Is is Lily in that group? No. Who was the the other last person? Sure. Okay. So by then Charlie Horde had taken over. Okay, thanks. So anyway, these are um, a distinguished set of gentlemen who were PIs of uh, the instruments, uh, and uh, plus uh, Ed Stone, who was the project scientist. Okay. So let's talk about Voyager flying past Jupiter. It was Voyager 1 in uh, 5th of March 1979, and Voyager 2 in uh, July of 79. So just six months apart, a lot of action. And this oh, is a movie, I don't know, if you, if you uh, 
don't look at this if you if you are <laughs> unlikely to have a uh, seizure. Um, <laughs> uh, you can see there's a lot of okay. So let me show you. In the meantime, of course, you can go on YouTube and find where someone has very carefully these days. You know, amateur astronomers have been these fantastic image processing have taken those original pictures and turned it into this lovely movie showing you um, the motions of the clouds. And you can see east and west belts. You can see the great red spot, which has been observed for over 300 years. It's been around a long time. Uh, and you can see the atmospheric bands, which have been observed on and off, uh, indeed, for uh, several centuries uh, since, since Huygens and, and the first <coughs> telescope. Uh, but they change uh, occasionally, a little bit bands come and go, but it's a fairly steady atmospheric <coughs> process. Now some of the fantastic pictures that were taken, I can remember seeing this picture, and in fact, I believe this was on the front page of the New York Times uh, when it first came out. We have uh, Jupiter in the background, Eo and Europa in front, uh, beautiful, fantastic picture of all the structure that had really not been seen before. The great red spot uh, and the turbulence around it, of course, um, uh, was, was superb and uh, told us about what was going on there. If you look at Voyager 1 at Jupiter and Voyager 2 at uh, Jupiter 2, uh, the, the, the Voyager 2, this is the six months later, and you can see great red spot and various structures. These um, the spots have moved together. You can see you know, some of the spots have moved around. Um, but this atmospheric structure is fairly constant at the time. Uh, not a lot of changes over the six months between them. You actually can see the great red spot swallowing up these, some of these eddies and spitting them out again. Or so. And I believe these are probably still continue to be the best pictures that we've got of these structures in the atmosphere of um, Jupiter, even though they were taken 33 years ago. What we have now is, uh, I'll just show you the Cassini images that were taken of the flyby on its way to Saturn. Beautiful, higher quality camera, but taken much further away. Um, but what you can see when you take the Voyager ones, tidy it up a little bit, and compare with what we have with Cassini, uh, you can again see not a huge change in the overall structure. Band structures are very similar, um, but you see again these, uh, these alternating bands that actually continue quite a long way up uh, towards the poles, which is what um, Juno will go and explore in a few years' time. So let's talk about the Galilean moons, Eo, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Eo and Europa are about the size of our moon. Ganymede is comparable to the size of Mercury. So these are big objects. And really what we learned from uh, Voyager was that these are their own worlds. These are worlds in their own right. They're not just sort of one moon all the same. They are very different in character, all with, with very different features and very different histories. Uh, and, and behaviors. EO uh, was very exciting because just before Voyager got there, there was a prediction by, and I've forgotten this name. Hugh. What was Saint it? Hugh. Sam Peel, thank you. That, uh, that EO could be, uh, uh, was being tightly heated inside and would be, could be having volcanoes on the surface. Uh, and uh, the volcanoes were in fact discovered by the young woman who was working on the navigation team. Her job was to take that image up there and fit a circle to the limb, and she was having a difficulty, you know, high residuals, couldn't make it work, and of course she realized when she looked at the picture that there was in fact something off the limb which was a volcanic plume, and later when we looked at the other images we realized there were uh, about a dozen or so volcanic plumes that were erupting, substantial volcanism on the surface. And so when then we looked at the pictures of EO, we saw 
the surface that had no craters, a very young surface. It was covered in these pockmarks of old volcanoes, some of them spewing out lava, and uh, there was a white frost, which is sulfur dioxide frost, the yellow is all sulfur, uh, and these big plumes were active. And we could see when we looked in closer, something that looked similar to the sort of volcanoes on Hawaii, of lava spewing out across the surface. Uh, and at the limb, you can sort of get a sense that these, this is a volcano sticking up. It actually has frost around it. Uh, quite high mountains. These are uh, comparable to the height of Everest, even though this moon is the size of our moon, much more, a quarter of the size of the Earth. Now, Europa, the next moon out, uh, we got kind of poor pictures with Voyager. We did, never got that close to Europa. We knew the surface was water, waterized from spectroscopic studies, and it seemed to have these cracks on it. It had this sort of brown, gunky stuff, but we didn't know what that was. Um, uh, but that was about it. This really was the best we had for Voyager, and that remained a mystery until Galileo flew by and um, they also its latest measurements. Ganymede, a uh, big moon, lots of activity, uh, in, in, in evidence of previous activity, geological structures uh, that uh, dark terrain, light terrain, impact craters where ice is, fresh ice is put onto the surface, and um, lots of geological activity uh, with um, places that were opening. Uh, cracks and so on. You could date the surface in some relative way. Places that had dark areas that had lots of impact craters were probably very old. Uh, younger surfaces, like these lighter ones, had fewer impact craters. So the geologists could go to town and start to work out maybe how this moon had been going through a lot of geological activity. But instead of having rock be the material that's turned over, this is ice. Callisto, on the other hand, was a pretty dead moon, covered in impact craters. You can see these white pop marks on the impact craters. In fact, there's one, if it, from, from your, your vantage point, you can probably see where there was a big impact and a, a bunch of, of uh, uh, rims around here where you can see this was a big cracking that was spread around. So this is, um, Callisto is a very old, has a very old surface and therefore thought to be largely geologically dead without uh, cracks and, and tectonics. And certainly no volcanoes like Io. So, <laughs> I did my PhD thesis using punch cards. And so this is what you did. You took one of these cards, you sat at a, at a, at a, a machine like this, you put the cards in here, and you had to type. There was no back button. You made a mistake. You had to get a whole new card and do it again. Right? And you put these all together in your, your, your Fortran code with um, uh, control states in front and so on. And the trick was, and I actually earned my living by uh, to start with by carrying um, these boxes from the MIT, um, one of the Mars people, and. Um, going to the computer center and carrying these boxes and carrying the, the uh, data. And the reason why these lines are here is in case you drop the box. <laughs> then you can put them all back in. Luckily, that didn't actually happen to me, but I religiously made, made those lines because you really didn't want to drop it. The data were put on these things. Seven and nine track tapes, these uh, magnetic tapes, which were all stored carefully. We had, for Voyager, we had uh, trajectory tapes and uh, uh, data tapes that were shipped by JPL to MIT, where we, you know, I, I used to carry the ones for the, for the Mars group that was paying me. And I think I can have 11 on each arm. <laughs> <laughs> My job was to deliver these when the new shipment came in. We changed the name of the tape using the, the control image on the, on the top cards. 
Okay. So progress was slow. You know, by the 80s, the thing about Voyager is that over the age of the, the, the by the time we got out to Neptune, the technology had completely changed between 1979 and uh, 1989. And there's about 10 years. And here we are sometime, this must be in around the uh, middle of the 80s, early 80s, early 80s, where we're working, we have consoles now. We don't have to use punch cards, but I mean, this, the, I, I, I think the reason why I'm wearing glasses is because of staring at those screens for hours. And this was actually in the uh, MIT place where the uh, plasma instruments were calibrated in the back. I mean, this was pretty crude. <laughs> okay, so Saturn. Quite quickly, uh, Voyager went from Jupiter uh, out to Saturn, and uh, 18 months or so later, um, in November of August, uh, November of 80 and August of 81, um, they arrived at, at Saturn and took these beautiful pictures of Saturn and the rings. We, of course, we know from telescopic observations that there were rings and, and, and this is the Cassini gap uh, and so on, um, known to be gaps, but the overall structure and, and the details were uh, amazing. The atmospheric, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The atmospheric structure, on the other hand, if we go back, and let me just show you this picture again. So you can't see very much here because it's, it's bright sunlight it's to concentrate, show the rings. But if you look at the atmosphere, because the mass of Saturn is a third that of Jupiter, uh, the scale height is um, very large. And so the, there's a lot of atmosphere that you're looking through, a lot of outer layers of haze, in order to see the clouds underneath. And so, unlike Jupiter, we have this nice swirling red spot and clouds going back and forth and lots of dots and so on. You have to really turn up the contrast in order to see these structures. But you're seeing the same sort of thing, east and west belts and uh, eddies and so on. So similar sort of dynamics, but um, buried uh, uh, deeper down, hard to see and, and somewhat subdued compared with uh, Jupiter. These are largely rotation driven in many ways. These are rotation dominating atmospheres. And Jupiter and Saturn actually rotate about the same manner. So it's the rings that were, were most exciting, very spectacular, multiple rings, rings within rings within rings. Uh, what was really important about Voyager was to see that these rings were being shepherded by uh, moons, you know, little rings being shepherded by moons. And this was a moonlet, so this was a big. I uh, think that was that. There was also, if you looked carefully using colors, you could see subtle differences in the colors. And of course, the temptation to just crank up the color yeah. index uh, to exaggerate the color was too much. And this is the sort of picture that you will see, of course, in all the textbooks and so on and so forth. But it's very exaggerated. The color is much, much more subdued. Now, of course, here we are. We have. Uh, we, what happened was that we'd go to JPL and spend some time there. This is Charlie Hall, who ask. I think this is Daryl Strobel, uh, who's a colleague of, of, of various people here. And we'd turn up, and it would be an exciting frenzy, feeding frenzy, looking at the data. But of course, the data were coming in, you know, these are lines, these are printers. It was coming in, and you're looking at, trying to understand what's going on. Uh, and indeed, Larry was uh, <laughs> there working with Lonnie Lane, uh, trying to discuss the data and what was going on. Uh, rings were, were, were one of Larry's interests. And here we have uh, a stellar occultation data, and I think this is Charles Barth, is yes. that right? Yeah. Um, so I think what's, uh, what they're looking at is the, uh, the stellar occultation where a star goes behind the rings, and by looking at the fluctuations in the starlight, you can see from this wiggly plot that was stretched across the hallway, uh, you could see the structure, the detailed structure of the rings. And this um, technique has been exploited by Larry and others uh, since. So one of the other great exciting discoveries were uh, these, these, these dark patches which seem to form kind of spokes. Oh, I can't say it's not, it's not working. All the other movies are working. Oh, 
go. We can maybe hit that. Yes. You can see these spokes. And this is what Larry has been, uh, not Larry, Mihai has been heavily involved in at the time and, and uh, uh, analyzing these. And um, he says he still doesn't understand them. Maybe uh, Nazis have that, but it's something to do with um, dust being levitated above charged dust and, and causing a shadow. So um, they're kind of mesmerizing. <laughs> Okay, so these are the sort of some of the cool things that were uh, observed by Voyager when uh, Voyager 1, Voyager 2 combined. Now, Titan was a major objective. Titan is a large moon of uh, Saturn. It was known to have an atmosphere from spectroscopic studies. It was known to have methane in the atmosphere, and nitrogen and a few other ingredients, I believe. And so this is, I think, Bill Hartman's painting uh, of what he thought it might be like on the surface of Titan, looking out at the majestic Saturn in the distance. And everybody wanted to know, what was what you going to see? What were they going to see? What were they going to find? Mm -hmm. So excited. Titan was going to be the place where all the action was going to be. <laughs> 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 and we got a fuzzy ball. <laughs> You know, if you look really carefully, you could see there was some structure in the atmosphere. Yeah. Crack out up a little bit, but yeah. couldn't see the surface. Uh, in fact, I think this is the best, highest contrast picture that was taken. You can see this fuzzy atmosphere. The atmosphere on the surface is one and a half times the pressure that we're breathing, breathing in this in this room, uh, and of course, the, the Cassini Huygens has, uh, has made fantastic observations. Voyager, it was a big disappointment, I think, that we really didn't learn a whole lot. We learned some other things from other other experiments, but it was very limited that we actually got from time Voyager. So Voyager 2, Voyager 1, uh, after Saturn was off, uh, it was on an escape trajectory, but uh, it actually went closer to Jupiter, and probably closer to Saturn, I'm not sure, but I think so, gained extra speed, was leaving the system, whereas uh, uh, Voyager 2 was targeted to go on to Uranus and Neptune. Of course, by then, after those spectacular results at Jupiter and Saturn, no way was NASA going to say, no, you've got to stop at, you know, at Jupiter. <laughs> of course you can keep going, right? And so uh, they went on to Uranus and Neptune, and, and uh, the funding continued. So you remember that Uranus is the, is, is one of the planets that sits on its side, and so the spin axis was pointed towards the sun, more or less, or the Earth, Earth and the sun, pretty much in the same direction. And all of the moons uh, were orbiting in that equatorial plane, which, is, which was, as Voyager was coming in, looked like a big bullseye with the moons going around and the rings around, and then uh, the North Pole was what we were looking at. We knew actually that Uranus had rings from ground-based stellar orbitations made by Gemellia. Uh, but uh, and we knew that there were all these little moons. So notice though that the whole thing all happened in a day. So this is uh, plus minus minus plus eight hours. So it's a, quite a quick flyby. So the sad thing here was. Even if you took the colors and cranked up the color index, it was kind of hard to see much structure in the atmosphere. You could sort of tell where the spin pole was. And if you looked very carefully, ignoring this blemish, which is a blemish on the camera, you could maybe see the clouds that were coming around. And you could measure some cloud speeds, but um, which were quite high, but not really the, anything like the excitement of the Jupiter pictures. But the moons were kind of fun. They're fairly small moons, uh, but uh, Miranda was, was uh, a lot of excitement. Uh, I remember looking at this cliff here, very dramatic cliff, which is actually about the height of El Cap. In fact, I think it's several times the height of El Cap, and it's probably ice. 
and I fantasize the idea of climbing up here because the gravity is like nothing to me. <laughs> 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 But there are, if you can see, it, it sort of is a bit of a mishmash, and the idea was that this was a moon that had broken up and then sort of uh, come back together. Maybe there'd been a big collision, broken up, and then re-accreted in some ways. The most exciting for me was the fact that the magnetic field that was detected at Uranus <coughs> was totally strange. It was uh, not tilted by 10 degrees like the Earth's, magnetic field or Jupiter's from the rotation axis, the North Pole, the South Pole being about 10 degrees apart. But it's about 60 degrees, 59 degrees. Furthermore, if you think of the magnetic field being a big bar magnet, it's offset uh, by about a uh, quarter of the way across the planet. So very strange and regular magnetic field. And because the planet is spinning, and with the solar wind coming in this way, the path of the going this way, what happens is that the magneto tail gets spun up into this um, swirly uh, tail. And with a bit of luck, we can see this movie that was made quite some time later, um, a simulation of what's going on. And you can see this um, tail going down the back. So uh, I. Uh, ended up having to give the uh, press conference for uh, the Uranus flyback for the plasma team because uh, two days before there had been the Challenger disaster and we had to cancel our press conference for Voyager, the final press conference. All of the press disappeared to the Cape and um, we, we carried on and did our press conference. Uh, but I stood up, I'd been prepped by one of the JPL people to stand up and be bold and say great things. And I said, this is the most weird and wonderful magnetic field we've ever been to. And um, my advisor at the time said, how on earth can you say something like that? <laughs> but it got a lot of lines. It was in the press. <coughs> and um, I got a lot of weirdo e uh, mail from people <laughs> who said, well, this is exactly what it says in my theory of the formation of the cosmos. <laughs> okay, on to Neptune, uh, August of 1989, uh, we flew by, and by then, not only did we have decent computers, but we had logos, and everything was all, you know, a lot more hit. And uh, the team was a little older, um, and this is a model of the Voyager. No, actually, it's kind of interesting to see. This is the size of the radio antenna, which is about 12 feet across. And this is the 40-foot um, uh, uh, magnetometer. So you get a sense of, you know, the idea is to measure the really weak fields. You need to get away from all the currents, electrical currents that happen in the spacecraft. Measure the field out here and have an onboard and outboard magnetometer so you can sort of separate out what was caused by currents in the spacecraft compared with uh, the ambient environment. That's why we have these long booms. OK. Still no women on the main team. <laughs> just, that didn't happen until Galileo. OK. Um, I think I spelt this disappointment on there. Uh, but isn't that misspelled? Yeah. Is it right? I can't spell to save my life. OK. Um, but. <coughs> Neptune was cool. There were lots of stuff there. There were clouds. Uh, there were uh, a big uh, spot here that had clouds going around it. We had belts and zones. Uh, we were back in business uh, in terms of uh, looking at the planet and, and seeing. So the reason why it's blue is there's a lot of methane in the atmosphere, and the methane absorbs the blue part of sunlight. Uh, sorry, the red part of sunlight. So what you see, the reflected sunlight that's coming out. Blue. That's why uh, both Uranus and Neptune look pretty blue. Uh, and these these white clouds, very high up clouds, probably methane clouds in the outer atmosphere. Triton, the large moon of Neptune, which is probably captured because instead of uh, uh, orbiting Neptune the way Neptune spins, it 
goes in the opposite direction, so it's a retrograde, probably captured, and are probably a Kuiper Belt object that was captured. So in many ways, this is the same sort of size and same sort of history, perhaps, apart from being captured, as Pluto. So this is currently our best idea of what Pluto might look like. So the same, same uh, distance. And um, we saw these pictures. This is a composite of many pictures. But what on earth is going on here? It's not geology that we're familiar with. Icy surfaces. There is this sort of strange, what's called cantaloupe terrain up here. It's called that. I'm not sure we really understand how it's formed. You see some impact craters, a few, you can see them. So it's not a, a totally fresh surface, but pretty fresh, not a lot of impact craters. And then in the southern hemisphere, there are these strange icy terrains with cracks. And with some <coughs> movies, you could see that these were black smokers, black uh, dust and gas coming out and being blown by a wind this way, producing these sort of, think of these as, as smokestacks. Very strange. And why is this happening in a surface that's uh, ice, it's very cold, um, and uh, probably frozen uh, nitrogen. So <coughs> an atmosphere of nitrogen. So a very strange surface. We just got a quick glimpse, and then off um, the spacecraft went uh, and away. So uh, Uranus's magnetic field was weird, and Neptune's was just as weird, if not weirder. It was also tilted by a large amount, 47 degrees, and offset by about a third of the uh, radius. In fact, you really can't use a dipole to describe it. It's a very non-dipolar uh, magnetic field. But what's interesting is, because of the orientation with respect to the solar wind and the spin axis, that as the, uh, as the planet spins and the magnetic field spins, the whole uh, configuration of the magnetosphere changes uh, over that spin period uh, and uh, completely reworks itself. So it's a very interesting magnetosphere to explore. We've had one flyby, that's it, uh, and um, we know no more about it. So Voyager's legacy. Uh, we can talk about the number of people who worked on this a lot of people worked on Voyager. But really, I think it inspired and trained a lot of uh, scientists. Uh, you know, uh, I grew up in the Apollo era, but I worked, I was an apprentice in the Voyager era. And um, many uh, colleagues went through that same training in many different ways, looking at the data, working with it, understanding how instruments work, and so on and so forth. And there's no doubt that it revolutionized our idea about moons and satellites. They're very different worlds, very different geology, geological histories. Completely changes our view of maybe how the solar system formed. It was the first time we got to see Uranus and Neptune up close. These are the big watery giants. They've got a lot of water inside them. Some people call them ice giants. But I think that's a, real, a serious misnomer um, because it's not like you, you would go through the atmosphere and go skating on some ice. It really is just water. You would go down deeper and deeper until that gas gets, gets thicker and thicker, and then eventually you would uh, move into, into water. But it's not like you can just sort of dive and swim around in liquid water, or that you could skate around on, on, on ice. These are very gassy objects, uh, where deep inside there is liquid water. And it's probably that liquid water that has uh, condensed, has, has um, uh, ions in it which allow it to be conducting and uh, have a magnetic field. We learned a lot about the moons, we learned a lot about rings, huge amounts about rings from those first observations. We learned a lot about atmospheres and magnetospheres. All very interesting, weird and wonderful things to look at. So, I, you know, I thought, oh well, we'll have another mission, and another one, and another one, and another one, and so on. But what I didn't really realize was the impact of these, particular of these missions until I thought about it later. I remember traveling in South America in um, the early 80s, 
and seeing books written in Spanish, textbooks for kids. So, you know, like these ones that you can find uh, in the libraries and so on, or, uh, that were for kids. But these were across the country, across the nation, across the world, these pictures were being used to, uh, in, in all sorts of levels, from kindergarten through to university, to talk about the solar system, talk about uh, what we know to be out there, to talk about space exploration, and to inspire people to go and think about the world out there beyond. So I think that uh, the Voyager came at a very important time when our technology was evolving. There was no internet, right? So these pictures were distributed as photographs. And you could, as a teacher, write in and have these photographs sent to you in the mail with a stamp. Um, but somehow, despite that crude technology, everybody was excited and, and wanted to see these pictures and were riveted to see these pictures. And I remember at the uh, Uranus and Neptune uh, encounters, uh, I know a colleague at MIT there would, would um, open up the auditorium and they would show pictures. My uh, friend who was there at the time saw this. They would have pictures coming up and everybody would go and look at the pictures. You know, in the same way that, that when we had Huygens Land on Titan, you know, I just took the day off and came here to last the watch to see what happened in the spectators So we, we, it was a big change in, in, in how things have changed. This was pre, obviously, the Mars rovers, but, but after Apollo. And this revolutionized uh, a lot of our uh, understanding, certainly the outer solar system, but also solar system formation. And of course, there's Carl Sagan's picture that he had made, uh, he, he got Voyager to take, of all of the planets, Jupiter, Earth, Venus, Saturn, Uranus. This is from uh, out beyond, your, uh, beyond Neptune, sorry, looking back on the solar system. The sun is in the center of this picture. And of course, he focused on the pale blue dot of Earth as seen from the outermost parts of the solar system and very eloquently described how this gave us a perspective about our own Earth and what we have here and what's special about this Earth. And I, I do encourage you to go check out have him listen to his speech, uh, which is very elegant, as you can imagine, I'll say, uh, about how we should think about the Earth and protect our planet, and, and how this uh, voyage on Voyager gives us that perspective. Uh, but the Voyagers live on, mm -hmm. uh, as does Ed Stone. <laughs> he, uh, the interstellar mission, uh, it's still going. Here they are. So now we zoom out. We've got uh, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. We have Pluto. We have New Horizons, which is on its way out to Pluto. We get there on Bastille Day 2015. We have Pioneer 10, which is off in this direction. Remember that went past Jupiter and Saturn. And then we have Pioneer over here, Pioneer 11. And then Voyager 1 up there and Voyager 2 down there, out uh, in the outermost part of the solar system. So you can go to this really cool website called heavensofblood.com and you can find out where things are right now. And uh, we can see that uh, in terms of units of the distance between the Earth and the Sun, that uh, Voyager 1 is the furthest object and it has been now, I think, since about 2007 or 8. At uh, 122 AU, Voyager is at 100. Pioneer 10 is 106. New Horizons is a piddly 24. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've been waiting, and it, it's nine years from Earth to Pluto, so we're getting a little impatient. Anyway, uh, so, but the other thing that's, there are a couple of other things that are kind of cool. You can look at the speed. So Voyager is, is uh, one is the fastest at 17 kilometers a second. Um, there was another couple of things I wanted to show. Yes, the one-way light time. So this is how long it takes the radio signal to get back to Earth from the spacecraft, okay? And so uh, you'll see we're talking up to six, 17 hours, right? And so 
Um, it's all automatic. The, the, the Voyager calls home uh, regularly, and uh, we use the biggest dishes, which are about uh, 200 feet across, to listen to the signal from Voyager. Uh, we're only listening to the magnetic field and the charged particle data at this point. Um, but you can see, uh, remembering that we're using a transmitter that is about 8 watts. 8 watts. Okay. Very good. But we can hear it uh, with uh, large dishes on the ground. So uh, this is where they are looking down. So we have, uh, uh, this is Neptune and Pluto. New Horizons on its way out, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, Pioneer 11, Pioneer 10. And then this is looking sideways. And this is pretty important, remembering Voyager 1 is up there, Voyager 2 is down there. And what I'm going to show you next is the, um, the relationship of this to the, uh, the solar wind and interplanetary media. Now, the original idea was that the material from the sun in solar wind expands out supersonically away from the sun. We know it blows out past all the planets, and we've been observing it. And then eventually what happens is, is it hits an obstacle. It basically is interacting with the interstellar medium around it. And when you take a supersonic wind and you hit an obstacle, you get a shock. In the same way, a plane, when it goes supersonically through the air, you get a, it goes past the sound barrier, you get a shock, you, you have that sonic boom. That's the same sort of, sort of thing. Uh, but in this case, it's inside the uh, boundary because the obstacle is in fact when this supersonic solar wind from the sun hits the outside. So the idea was that there would be this termination shock which is in fact being observed by Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 and then at some point you would go out into the interstellar medium through what's called a heliopause, helios being sun, pause being sort of boundary and uh, the idea was that probably the interstellar winds would be supersonic and you'd have another shock out here. And so we thought of this as sort of a bit like a magnetosphere with a shock up front, flow around, and then this interior structure inside. So this was the view as of about six months and before, six months from now, from, uh, earlier than now and, and before, and everyone's been waiting for Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 to go, to go through these boundaries. And it's like, any day now, any day now, keep our little spacecraft going, please. Keep going, give us a bit more money. Yes, we can do it a bit more cheaply this time. Yes, mm -hmm. you know, all this sort of stuff. <laughs> um, but what's happening is that we really are now um, going, going out. So this is the pressure, the dynamic pressure of the solar wind. And you can see this is where we hit the uh, termination shock and we went into a low speed, low pressure region out there in, in 2010. Uh, and really now what we're seeing with Voyager 1 is a region of stagnated flow on the outside. Now, uh, there's uh, other observations that are made uh, that give us a, a, an indication now that probably the outer flow is not supersonic, so you don't have a shock on the outside. But it's not clear if we've gone through the heliopause. So this is what we think is happening. This is, a, this is the illustration. That I, I'm not sure how useful this analogy is. Think of this as a, a basin, right, with a plug here, with a, with a plug hole here. And you're putting water from the tap. And uh, it flows out. It has fast flow. And then it hits this uh, sort of like shock. And then it's slow outside. So that's what we think we, we've gone through, is in, it, out of the shock and into this slow flow outside. This is a simulation that John Belcher made at MIT um, where the plasma instrument is actually only working on Voyager 1, Voyager 2, on Voyager 2, Voyager 1, only one of the four sensors are working. Um, and they do expect to see it when it gets really deflected around on the outside. So you've got supersonic flow, you have a shock, and then you have the flow around it. And if the interstellar medium is subsonic, as we now believe it to be, then it will be flowing around without a shock up front. 
So the very recent results, and I think these are, let me see, what's that? As of Monday, September the 10th, you can see there's a lot of excitement that over the past months, few months, so October, September, August, July, in the past, this summer, just as we celebrate this 35th anniversary, it looks as if Voyager is perhaps uh, eminently about to, you know, just about to imminently going outside on it and eminently, imminently about to leave. Uh, and uh, what's happening is that the solar wind, the interior, what's called the anomalous cosmic rays, seem to be decreasing in flux, whereas the stuff from the outside, the galactic cosmic rays, seem to be increasing. And everybody's saying, is it, is it going to be this week? Are we going to <laughs> any day now, any day now. Um, but the actual nature of this, this boundary, there's some debate about it. So, past 35 years, fantastic collection of results, big milestones along the way. Uh, and, you know, it's the little spacecraft that could and did a huge amount. Uh, and, they will continue. There's enough power to keep going uh, for another uh, 10 years or so, uh, maybe longer. Uh, you can probably listen for a long time using the big dishes. Um, but the question is, once it gets out into interstellar space, uh, will we still continue to listen? You know, at some point, people say, you know, we've got the science. This is getting to be tough. Is it really worth expending all this energy and effort and taxpayers' money uh, to keep it going? And at some point, it may be turned off. And who knows? Maybe it will be found <laughs> <laughs> when it goes somewhere else in the universe. Thank you very much. Yeah.